What, what could be a more joyous way to start an SRI Congress? Thank you very much to the Camerata Choir of the University of Pretoria and to their conductor, Michael. Thank you so much for accommodating my wish to have them moving around and doing all those things. Thank you so much. Good morning to you all. I'm Stephanie Burton. I am a professor at the University of Pretoria in the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, and I'm a professor at Future Africa, and I am the former Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research uh, and Postgraduate Education, which was a position I held when Future Africa was being established. My real role here today, though, is as a member of the Executive Committee of, of SRI 2022. And my job for this short period of time is simply to be the program director and to make sure that we welcome you in an appropriate way. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, just to say, mention in particular the to a welcome to our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Coupe, uh, to Dr. Phil Majahwa, who is the Director General for the Department of Science and Innovation. Um, and thank you so much. Phil is a good friend of Future Africa, and we're delighted to have you with us in person. There will also be some other welcome messages, so I'm not going to go through uh, all of the names right now. But there is a very important symbolic step that we need to take first before we have the welcome addresses. And that is to mark the transition from the process of the previous SRI Congress, SRI 2021, to this SRI 2022. And that comes with um, a bridge between what was, hap what was hosted in Brisbane last year and what is now going to take place here. The group who, who hosted that created a message to pass on to the next host. It's called a message stick in line with the um, Australian traditional um, Na First Nations people. A, mes a, a message stick is uh, a traditional way of conveying an important message. And this Brisbane message stick will be handed over to Professor Coupe as a symbol of handing over the responsibility for SRI uh, Congress to, to our committees and to our community. So the message stick has a message um, which comes there as a start. I'm not going to read it to you. I know you can all read. But that is the first prime message that comes with the message stick. And it's really a, a message of responsibility. The message stick also has with it uh, a, a number of uh, indications of what we should have learned from SRI 2021 and five essential actions which should come from last year to us. There they are very simply. There is a great deal more that can be said and we can give the text. It, is, it will be on the web page. But it symbolically passes all of that on to us. And then there is just an instruction at the end of the, of the message which says that this is learnings which we should bring into our Congress. We have online Paul Birch, who is the science director of the Australian CSIRO, who hosted the, the uh, 2021 Congress, and he is now just going to say uh, a, a short <coughs> message, a few words, to hand over the message stick. And after that, I'm going to ask Erica Key, who is here with us, also on the XCOM and who was also with the Brisbane meeting, to actually hand over the message text. So the first thing now then is uh, to ask Paul Birch to deliver his message. And I am wait for our technical team to make that happen. Yes. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be able to do this. And uh, congratulations to Future uh, Africa for uh, uh, organizing such a uh, impactful meeting. I just wanted to mention that there is a video uh, that's available and I would recommend uh, watching that video. Uh, Jim Walker, who's an indigenous man from uh, we, Queensland. We, we can't uh, hear the, the message, I'm afraid. Hello? Hello, can you hear me now? Apologies. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Future Africa uh, on a successful uh, meeting and wish you all the best. Let's, uh, I would recommend uh, looking at a short video uh, that was made around the significance of the message stick. Uh, some of you may know that uh, indigenous Australians were made uh, had two to 300 different languages. And so it was an image that uh, uh, communicated very important information uh, as uh, First Nations people moved around uh, the large continent. Uh, and uh, the artist is uh, Brenton Bowen, who's a, a Kuku Yimiter speaking man from Hope Vale, which is in far North Queensland. Uh, it's a really remarkable piece of work. And uh, the all of the images uh, are described uh, and I won't go into them, uh, but uh, again, I, I'm really pleased to be able to uh, uh, hand this over on behalf of Future Earth Australia, CSIRO, and the Consortium of Queensland Universities uh, that sponsored last year's meeting. And we'll also be hosting uh, the Oceania satellite meeting uh, next week. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We are not going to show the video now. We will show it later in due course. Um, but we are a little short on time. We don't want to disturb the schedule of the conference right at the beginning. So I am going to ask now Dr. Erica Key, who is the director of the uh, Future Earth Hub in the United States, but as I say, member of our ex uh, executive community for the conference, if she would please hand over the message stick and just, if you can, I don't know if we have the picture on this, we'll have a picture on the screen, but if you could just hold it up, Erica, it is actually an Aboriginal artwork which has the message in it. Um, so there it is, and we will have a place of honor for that in due course at Future Africa. So Erica's going to hand it to Professor Coupe as a symbol that we are now taking over the SRI Congress. Thank you. And Professor Coupe, if you'd like to just let Haida look after that for a minute. Um, it's my honor to invite you now, Professor Coupe, to come and give a welcome message to the, to the members of the Congress. Over to you. Thank you, Professor Betten. Thank you, Professor Erika Kies. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you at this Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress for 2022 and on behalf of the University of Pretoria. And I thank our Australian colleagues for the symbolic handover of the message stick which signifies the start of this 2022 Congress. I'd like to say a special word of welcome to our honored guests attending in person we welcome the representatives of the Embassy of Japan in South Africa, Mr. Yamada Takehiro and Ms. Fayaz Ashley Nega, and attending online. We welcome His Excellency, the Ambassador of the State of Qatar, Ms. Helena Lobato de Jonada, representing the Embassy of Brazil in South Africa. Mr. Jose Ignacio Giulio Ali, Charge de Affairs in the Embassy of Colombia, and Mr. Kangaziwe Mabuza, Principal Secretary for the Minister of Tourism and Environmental Affairs in Eswatini. His Excellency, Mr. Viriato Luis Sores Kasama, Minister of Environment and Biodiversity of Guinea Bissau. A word of welcome also to our speakers for this first plenary session. Dr. Phil Mjuara, a great friend of the University of Pretoria, Director General of the Department of Science and Innovation. Dr. Judy Lamini, Chancellor of, v of Wits University, Mr. Jonathan Mwambo, Inter-University Coordinator for Burundi. I would like to greet members of the Executive Committee of SRI 2022, who represent the, the three hosting organizations and who have been the key organizers of this large and complex meeting. Dr. Erika Key and Dr. Vera Misna, welcome now to see you in person, not on Zoom, from Future Earth, Dr. Nicole Abba from the Belmont Forum, Professor Stephanie Betten from A Future Africa. And I greet all of you, our conference delegates present 
here and online as is the ways of the world these days, hybrid uh, events. <laughs> Preparations for this conference have taken long in the making, and it is a great pleasure to see everyone here and to have the evening starting, the event, the event starting at last. My colleagues here at Future Africa have been working on the preparations since last year when we hosted a satellite event for SRI 2021. It's held in Brisbane, as you heard, and when we put in a bid to host SRI 2022. Allow me to talk a little bit about future, the Future Africa Institute and the Future Africa campus and the work that we're doing here. Future Africa at the University of Pretoria is a pan-African institute, and its work is driven by principles of sustainability and equity. Future Africa is a platform which brings together networks of people from many sectors, nationally and across the continent and the world, who are interested in the challenges which Africa faces to work together, to find solutions, and to influence policy, as well as to create new knowledge that can create sustainable new futures. The nature of the SRI 2022 Congress resonates very well with the goals of the Investor of Pretoria. This is a transdisciplinary meeting focused on scholarship, collaboration, innovation, as well as advocacy for transformations towards global sustainability. Future Africa's mission is to accelerate transformations to global sustainability through research and innovation. And the Belmont Forum is an international partnership that mobilizes funding for environmental change and sustainability research. This SRI 2022 Congress has brought together leaders and experts in sustainability science, as well as industry practitioners, policymakers, and innovators. I'm especially pleased that we also have many early career scientists attending the meeting. I hope they will enjoy the opportunity to network and build new collaborations. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be speaking in the next session in the plenary on African science and innovation in Africa. For now, I welcome you and I trust that you will enjoy your time with us at SRI 2022 at the University of, of Pretoria at the Future Africa Institute and Campus. Thank you. And I'm now going to invite the interim director of Future Africa, Dr. Haida Hackman, who is known to many of you, but to just say a few words about Future Africa. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends. You know, as a participant of the very first meeting in September 2009 that led to the creation and establishment of Future Earth, and as a former member of the Future Earth Governing Council, a representative partner, representative of the Belmont Forum, and now in my exciting new position as Interim Director of Future Africa, it's a huge pleasure for me to welcome all of you um, here and online to SRI 2022 and to Future Africa. And I must just say, personally, I'm so excited. There are so many friends and colleagues that I haven't seen for a long time who've really been deeply involved in building Future Earth, in building the Belmont Forum, and it's just so exciting to know that we're going to be able to spend time together this week. I want to thank the Future Earth and Belmont Forum leadership for recognizing the importance of convening in Africa. And for entrusting Future Africa under the leadership of uh, Professor Burton for co-organizing and hosting this event. You know, I think we all go to conferences for many reasons, but at the heart of it is the willingness, the desire to collaborate, the importance of collaboration. And as our Vice Chancellor has said, Future Africa is a collaborative platform. We seek to foster meaningful collaboration across disciplines, across institutions, across geographies, and across sectors. And we do so in order to develop and unleash the transformative potential of African research and scholarship 
for Africa and for, therefore for the world. SRI 2022 brings the world to Africa, but I have no doubt that you are going to be inspired by, your, by the creativity and the contributions of your African colleagues. And as honored as we are to host you, make no mistake, we also have high expectations of your participation. We are seeking new partnerships, new ideas, exciting exchanges, and new collaborations to build on in the future. Welcome again, and thank you very much, Stephanie. So ladies and gentlemen, as you've heard, the um, staging or hosting of SRI 2022 is a collaboration. It's a collaboration between Future Earth, the International Network for Sustainability Science, uh, and the Belmont Forum, and Future Africa at the University of Pretoria. So I'm no now going to ask my colleagues on the EXCO. First, Dr. Erica Key, who is the director of the Future Earth Hub uh, in the United States. And then after that, Dr. Nicole Arbour, who is the executive director of the Belmont Forum. And they are each just going to say a few words about their organizations and about <coughs> their role at SRI 2022. Erica, thank you. Thank you. Welcome, delegates. The Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress is a unifying event bringing together thought leaders, implementers, and actors from around the globe to advance knowledge to action. Future Earth is honored to play a central role in this convening, creating community with the world and its global research networks, providing an inclusive setting to co-develop resilience approaches, and embracing new ways of knowing and doing. We do this in collaboration with many partners and sponsors, weaving together their networks and perspectives from across sectors and bridging boundaries. Thank you for your interest, your investment, and your deep participation in delivering this Congress. We look forward to working with you for years to come, building this community and showcasing the visions of our hosts and those joining us today. Welcome. Hello, everybody. It's almost, it's still a bit surreal to see people in person. I'm very much enjoying seeing all of the friendly faces. There's lots of old friends and new friends, and the hazard of coming last after such a wonderful crew of speakers is that there's not much I can say that can add to such a, a great, I mean, and after that choir, honestly, who can, who can beat that? Anyways, uh, my name is Nicole Arbor, as was mentioned. I am the executive director of the Belmont Forum, and it's also an organization that is aiming to bring people together, to, to help us to think about, to work together, to foster global environmental change, to bring our resources together, to think about what kind of research do we need to do to get societal impact. And while I was not the um, originator of the conference, I have taken this on from people whose vision I thoroughly believe in and I'm very happy to take forward, um, I do feel that uh, the opportunity here for all of us to come together and to really think about what are, how, what are the ways we can work together? How can we make a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts? And so with this conference, um, I'm really happy to ha see all of you here, uh, both in person and online, and I'm trying to find the camera so I can make sure I'm looking at the online folks too. There we go. Hi, guys. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to a great conversation. So please um, enjoy, enjoy each other's company, enjoy the online sessions, and we look forward to the next adventures and, uh, and, and whatever you do, don't, there's like 200 sessions, there are so many options and so many wonderful things for you to participate in here. So we're really looking forward to getting, um, getting to know everybody. Thank you very much. So colleagues, that brings us to the next thing. That concludes our opening session and I think we now 
uh, are familiar with who everybody is and where we're going to go with this. The first event of the uh, meeting is our first plenary session. And I'm going to hand over the chair, at least the moderation role, to, uh, we have um, Axel Threlfall, who will be online in a moment um, as the moderator for this session. And we have Dr. Phil Majaku, we have Professor Coupe, we have Dr. Glamini, Glamini on, oh, there we go. Axel's there. Um, Dr. Glamini is also online. So this is going to be a, a, a little unusual to have the session run in this hybrid way, but it is, it is the way I think a number of our sessions are going to go. So let me uh, wish our moderator all the best for moderating this. Thank you for doing that for us. And we're very much listening, looking forward to listening to what our plenary speakers have to say. Good. Thank you. Much indeed. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Axel Threlfall. I'm uh, editor at large. Uh, Reuters, uh, the news organization. I'm based out of London. Uh, I am joining, of course, virtually. It's a great shame. I wish I could be uh, with you all uh, over there. Um, welcome um, to this opening plenary session of the uh, 22 uh, uh, SRI uh, Congress. We've got a, a, a super audience today, a global audience, 1,500 uh, participants, 107 countries, I'm told, uh, attending both on site and, of course, um, online as well. We, we want to bring this global audience together. This is uh, always something we want to do with these, especially with these hybrid sessions. So we're going to make this as interactive as we can. SRI is all about uh, connection and action. Please feel free to to, uh, uh, to add your questions to the chat box if you're attending online or, or indeed if you're in the room, raise your hand uh, and we'll get a microphone to you. There are mic runners um, in the room. Um, we're going to uh, start with sh some short introductory remarks. I, 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 we've asked the, the speakers to keep those, those pretty short, about uh, f five minutes max. Uh, then we're going to move on to a moderated conversation. Uh, then we'll go on to uh, the Q&A session. So I, I, I hope we get lots of um, questions from you, our audience. Um, very quickly uh, about the plenary session today. Th this really, the purpose of this is to elevate, to celebrate research and innovation in Africa, the STI strategy for Africa 2024 and other initiatives have started, uh, as we all know, changing the paradigm of how the world engages with the continent. Africa has a, a suite of innovations such as uh, popular uh, mobile transfer systems to boost economic growth, to broaden inclusion, to support sustainable development. Um, of course, uh, as we're all well aware as well, the, the uh, SDGs um, will not be possible without uh, a better recognition, a better use, a better support of research and innovation in Africa. Uh, the continent is critical for our global future. The youngest population of any region in the world, median age of 20, roughly a decade lower uh, than the global median. Um, so today we ask the questions, how can we best uh, support and adv advance research and innovation uh, in sustainability in Africa? And what can African research and innovation, and this is important, teach uh, the rest uh, of the world? So hopefully we'll uh, hear both pieces of that. I'm joined by uh, a, a dynamic group of leading figures eager, get, eager to get their teeth in uh, to these uh, subjects. Uh, let me introduce them now. I'll then, as I said, hand the floor over one by one for some opening comments, and then we'll get into uh, our discussions. Um, Dr. Phil um, Dwara, uh, Director General, Government of South Africa, the Department of Science and Innovation. Dr. Judy uh, Delamini, um, Founder and Chairman of the McMahony Group. Professor Tawane Coupe, who we've already heard from, of course, Vice Chancellor and Principal at the University of Pretoria, and Dr. Maximiliano Feremene, a Research Manager at the National University of Equatorial uh, Guinea. Um, Dr. Juara, um, I'd like to hand the floor over to you first, uh, if I may, for your opening remarks. And, and I guess what I'll do is just to set the context here, clearly you have uh, extensive science policy experience. So scaling projects, funding projects, getting um, better policy backing for projects are all critical here. Let me throw those ideas out as a context uh, for your opening remarks, if I may. The floor, uh, Dr. Mjuara, uh, is yours. 
Uh, I hope you can hear me, and thanks very much, moderator, for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. I apologize um, that I was supposed to bring some slides to interest you in some exciting pictures, but I was told clearly, no slides. <laughs> so, um, but the first point that I'd like to share with the meeting is how important research is to the work that we do in South Africa in science policy. We believe that uh, in these days when governments and everyone is excited about innovation, there is a big danger of diverting resources away from research uh, to harness knowledge for innovation purposes. So let me speak about what we have done in South Africa to support this, in particular in this area of sustainability research. We convinced our politicians, uh, but most importantly, we convinced our scientists that it is important for us to choose some of the areas so that we can concentrate resources on those areas. So in 2006 and also in 2010, we realized that South Africa has a geographic advantage, that it's probably one of the few areas globally that has two oceans that meet in the southern tip of Africa, the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean. We also realize that we have Antarctica not far from here. And that whole area, if you like, is important for understanding climate change because I'm told that uh, for the Europeans, the fish stocks in North Atlantic are influenced by the currents in these two oceans that are meeting. So we then set up a, a center which is called Applied Center for Climate and Earth System Science, ACCESS as it is called. And we put a sizable amount of money for the scientists to do research in this sphere in Southern Africa in particular in order to understand therefore how uh, we will be affected by climate change. So on the research side, we think uh, this uh, applied center has done very, very well, uh, as well as the number of students, masters and, and doctoral students that have been funded. Just to give you a sense of how well they've done in research, they continue to be um, approached by the IPCC. They make significant contributions um, to the Group on Earth Observation Biodiversity Observation Network, GeoBorn, and other international bodies that are looking for this research in order to understand how um, the Earth system actually works. We also, of course, work with the National Research Foundation that has a South African Environmental Observation Network, SION, which is an in situ a set of observations, and they also contribute to the uh, international long-term ecological research, ILTA, if you're familiar with them. So there we've done very, very well. But what we, we have not done well is how does this research that has been funded well and that has a global recognition help us in South Africa and sub-Saharan Africa to, to translate this science and research into policy? So this is an area in the next couple of years which we would like to focus attention on. And we have started to look at what happened in KZN with the floods and we've been able to put together a number of research groups, the Scion, the South African Risk and Vulnerability Atlas, as well as ACCESS, to give us a better sense of how we can in future avoid disaster or at least mitigate against the disaster such as the one that happened in KZN. So research and forming strong institutions and then make sure that uh, you contribute to the global knowledge of understanding how the earth system works uh, is our first point. The second one is uh, we also made a choice that since we have about 75% of platinum group metals in South Africa and platinum in particular, 
Um, and then we also have an abundance of sun. It does make sense for us to start looking at hydrogen and green hydrogen in fuel cells as an area of research and innovation. So we yeah, are moving more towards innovation. And to date, uh, since 2009, we have invested in three institutions that are looking at how you can then develop catalysts that are responsible for converting um, hydrogen as a molecule into a proton and an electron. And this work was done at the University of Cape Town, but also to make sure that we have the infrastructure where you can then have hydrogen as a carrier and you can have refueling stations. And then thirdly, uh, to make sure that uh, you have systems uh, that you can then um, develop. And to this effect, we've now uh, completed something which we call a hydrogen society roadmap. And it has identified two projects that I'd like to share with you today. The first one is what we call the uh, Platinum Valley. We would like to convert all the material handling equipment uh, in our ports in Durban and Richards Bay. And the buses that are traveling along the N3 from Durban to Johannesburg. Uh, we would also like to convert uh, the production of uh, steel in Highfeld using green hydrogen. And then there's a big mine in Mohalakwena in the northern part of the country. And we have started working with partners and probably recently you had the conversion of one of these big trucks in the mine that move um, material in the mining uh, from diesel to, um, to hydrogen fuel cell. When all of those trucks are converted from diesel to hydrogen fuel cells, it will be equivalent to taking 80,000 vehicles on the road. So you can estimate the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that you can get, get rid of. But in the process of doing this, uh, we would like to um, make sure that we increase the demand for hydrogen and reduce the cost so that when it's between 1.5 and $2 uh, per kilogram, everybody starts to use hydrogen fuel cells as I say, whether it's in the trucks, in the buses, uh, and also in stationary applications. We've been very, very lucky in South Africa that this has been accepted as a strategy uh, which can help us to mitigate against climate change. Uh, and we have been able to receive support from uh, one of the sister departments that has larger resources to commercialize this work that we've been doing over the last 10 years. What I need to say, though, which is subtle in the points that I've made, is that as scientists and as policymakers, there is a lot of advocacy work that we need to do to convince politicians about the value, both of the research that we do, but also for them to invest in innovation, like the 10, 15 year program on hydrogen fuel cell work that uh, we've been doing. And we were pleasantly surprised two years ago to be told that we'll be given about 1.2 billion rands uh, as an innovation fund to fund innovations that show promise from research that can be taken into the marketplace. We've got this year to convince government that that money was well spent. And um, I hope that I'll be able to tell the story of what happened to that at your next SRI uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamara. Um, and you've, you know, you've raised some fascinating uh, and recurring um, um, issues there and themes there, in particular, policy cooperation, this idea of convincing politicians here, convincing politicians there. It's something no doubt we'll get into in a little bit more detail in our in our discussions when we open this up. Um, I'd like to give the floor now to uh, Dr. Judy Dlamini. Um, 
Dr. Dlamy, you you have a, a, an incredibly rich uh, career across a number of different sectors. You've worked as a, a medical and an academic doctor, a businesswoman, an author, a philanthropist, different many different sectors of the economy. So you 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 have this this super perch from which to to view everything. Let, let me throw a general question out there, and you can use that to take this where you want with your opening uh, thoughts cross-sector collaboration, or well, collaboration within sectors, but of course across sectors, collaboration uh, with policymakers, with civil society, with NGOs. How are we doing? Uh, thanks very much, Axel, and uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pity I'm not there, but it's an honor to be part of this. Uh, I just want to make a presentation, Axel, if that's fine with you. Uh, let me see if I can share. Uh, which will talk to that collaboration across disciplines. Uh, can you see the slide? Yeah, we can see it fine. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Let me just make it in presentation mode. Great. So I thought uh, wearing the different caps that I wear, I would actually choose one that I believe is very important. Uh, it addresses SDG three and five. Uh, it addresses the biggest uh, group, uh, women uh, in the globally, actually not just uh, in South Africa. And uh, that is a case study uh, of Tutuzela Care Centers that shows uh, the collaboration, uh, I mean, multidisciplinary, uh, NGOs, government, and uh, of course there are challenges that uh, it doesn't have all the, the solutions, but it actually shows what can be done and achieved if there is collaboration. So when we were faced, which we still are, by high incidence uh, of sexual uh, offenses, domestic violence, HIV, uh, this was in the 90s, uh, coming to 2000s and um, pregnancy, which we still have in SCIs, uh, the approach was that let us look at finding a victim or survivor centered um, solution uh, that you can, that can actually be a collaboration uh, between the different departments of government and the different sectors outside government. So the Tutu Zela Care Center uh, objectives was to hold the perpetrator accountable. It was to protect the survivor in different ways that I'll share very briefly. And it was also to screen for HIV, STIs, uh, and uh, pregnancies and actually prevents un unwanted pregnancies from a sexual offense. So this is a multidisciplinary approach. And what is important is that it is survivor uh, centered. So for those that don't know about the Tutuzela Care Centers, they were started in 2000, uh, led by the National Prosecuting Authority, which is under the Department of Justice. And uh, it is multi-sectorial and it is integrated in the sensitive approach uh, to the survivor uh, of sexual abuse. And uh, currently we have 56 TCCs, we need more. And uh, they seek to combine, uh, as I said, the different um, challenges that we face, especially by women and children. And it's a one-stop uh, facility. So the strategy, is a multi-prong uh, strategy. And here I just share the different, sorry, the different uh, sectors uh, and departments that are involved, which is an example of collaboration across sectors. So we have the Department of uh, Justice, which is the main um, and the leading partner in this, uh, but we also have the Department of Health. Uh, all the Tutu Zela Care Centers are hosted in the public hospitals. I do hope that public hospitals will also enter uh, the fray. Uh, there is always a police station which is under safety and security uh, that is involved uh, because uh, to make sure that the forensic side of things uh, takes uh, is taken care of, uh, there's Department of Social Development, 
which I like because for a very long time, we didn't take care of the psychosocial uh, aspect of the survivors of uh, gender-based violence. And uh, working with NGOs, uh, civil society, the Department of Social Development uh, is able to offer the service, uh, but of course there's a private sector in terms of donors, uh, but there can always be a, an improvement. And uh, I, it's a side conversation that I would have with our uh, DG in, at DTI, the Department of uh, Small uh, Business, because one of the challenges that women face, and unless that is addressed, will never attain uh, the SDG five, which is economic empowerment of women, because that's what you need to have uh, gender equity. Um, and uh, which is one of the areas that we can work uh, with the economic cluster uh, in government and the private sector to address. And of course, the Department of Housing, one of the challenges we have is that uh, domestic violence uh, takes uh, women and children out of the home and they find themselves uh, not having a place uh, to recollect themselves. And uh, unfortunately, Tutuzela care centers don't offer this as yet. So I'm sharing this because uh, I think cross-sectoral collaboration is key. Uh, it reduces duplication of resources. Uh, there is provision of knowledge and experience on the successes and uh, failures. Uh, and of course, the seamless flow of information depending on how uh, it, it is handled. But uh, I do believe that joint monitoring and uh, evaluation, uh, which uses a transdisciplinary research, is uh, what is uh, the initiative calls for. Uh, so we still have a high problem uh, of the challenges that have uh, indicated. And I do believe uh, while a lot has been done as shared, a, a transdisciplinary research on monitoring evaluation, including many different uh, uh, disciplines would be very important in coming up with an overarching policy for accountability uh, to eradicate the sketch uh, that uh, I've just shared. Uh, I'll just uh, stop there, uh, Excel, um, to make, make sure that I don't over okay. pay my time. Judy, time. Judy, thank you, thank you very much indeed for that uh, that presentation. Um, and and just uh, just a very quick question on the back of it before I go to our next speaker. You 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 mention all the different parties involved here. Where, where along the chain, Judy, would you say you see the biggest room for improvement or the biggest weaknesses and what and, and the biggest potential uh, to help in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an issue like the one that you've outlined? Uh, there are two uh, in my view, Excel. The first one is on justice, because when you look at any uh, crime, uh, unless there is recourse um, and um, justice is served, then people continue uh, mm. to, do, to, con to do the crime. And uh, we have a lot of examples uh, in this country of that. So I do believe that we can strengthen prosecution. And uh, I mean, you could write books about that. The second one is the one that I mentioned, the economic empowerment of women because they don't leave the perpetrators because of uh, economic uh, challenges, they dependent on them. So for me, those two will go a long way, both in accountability, in prevention, uh, but also in empowering women and get us closer to SDG5. Very good. SDG5. All right, Judy, thank you very much indeed. And we'll come back to uh, the empowerment of, uh, of women when we open this up to a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let, let me uh, give the floor to uh, Maximiliano Ferromene, um, who joins us now from uh, uh, Equatorial Guinea. Um, I, I, we, I guess we'd like to hear your, the perspective from, from, from your country, something you're particularly keen to share with us, uh, something that other African countries might, might learn from. Uh, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Schaefer. And can you hear me? Yes, hear you fine. Okay, okay good. Yeah, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, translating traditional knowledge into science. Uh, I choose this because a botanist 
and um, I study plants. And I work also at the university for as a research manager. And I'm in touch with many people from different areas. And I noticed that during the two past years, uh, during the COVID pandemic, and we still been there, well, but we are now better. Uh, I see that many people use uh, traditional remedies to to try this, uh, to try to get solution about the, the pandemic. But before we go into that, I would like to say that Equatorial Guinea is a very small country, so it's west of Central Africa, and then we we have uh, we share with uh, Gabon in Cameroon, and then all Congo. We are in the Congo Basin, and so we have a, a large uh, forest. And also we have like the three to four, five small island, Bioko Island, and then south and this uh, Anubon Island is uh, is uh, more in the south part of the country, after South Tomé Principe. So the the country is uh, has different ecosystems and different uh, parts. It is not uniform uh, and. And that's why it makes it a, a very rich country concerning biodiversity. And, and so uh, people uh, in the country used to, to treat uh, diseases with traditional remedies. But during the two past years, there was like uh, going back to, to early, early uh, years in the, in the in the human development society, society of development. So uh, we are, we noticed that uh, many people in a lot along the country get uh, treat, uh, they, they get uh, treatment using uh, plants, using uh, other type of solution, mostly plants, but also combining this plant with uh, natural and uh, spiritual knowledge. But there is a, a huge gap between this traditional knowledge and science. Traditional healers, uh, many times they don't uh, rely on scientists. So it's difficult to, us to get information from, from healers how they use the plants and scientists can uh, check if these plants are really good or associated with the uh, what we, we want to, to trade. So uh, I, I have been talking with different uh, stakeholders, the Ministry of Science, uh, Ministry of uh, Health, people from the, uh, our scientific council in the country and scientific scientists from the university. And one of the biggest challenges we have here is how to uh, work together and bring this knowledge into science and later maybe we can transform, we can make advances and produce like medicines, process medicines, and, and we can continue uh, looking for solution for many, many of these diseases that we have in, 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 in the country, for example, malaria, typhoid fevers, and, 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 and many, many, many others. So uh, another problem we have here is that uh, how to convince politicians. Many times politicians take decisions, make decisions, but the scientific community stay away from those decisions. So this is another problem that we, we have. And uh, I was listening to Dr. Uh, Zawara. I don't know if I have, as his, his, his name is difficult to pronounce by me, but I was, I was excited when he was explaining that in South Africa, they tried to get involved politicians and convince them to, 
make decisions together and select and decide what to what to do and what to uh, invest or what to put money on in order to have a better research uh, research uh, answers and better in, in order to to progress in order to to enhance research sustainable research and innovation in south africa so i think that this experience is very good and it it will be very good if if we can share i mean uh, south africa and other countries can share their experiences in order to make like a african uh more more united development in africa because there is a huge gap uh, between central african countries particularly equatorial guinea in the southern african countries and northern african in eastern africa and even west africa countries are so central africa is is, is a very least developed concerning science and, and technology but there is a africa is like a huge laboratory and uh, we have like so many things to to study so many questions to answer and then this is what i, I wanted to, to share with us is that like uh, i see like there is a financial challenge very big one in the Equatorial guinea particularly we don't have uh, a support for to do our research and uh, another problem is technological technologically and what we are we are trying to to address this one and in, 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 in the third part we have like capacity building researchers at the university level we have uh, very few uh, lecturers that they want to be involved in research because many people think that doing research is like uh, not what they they are mean to do but that is a big problem we have here so i i am very excited to be with you today and then and learning a lot i will try to share all these experiences with my colleagues at the university and also all around the country and i just i will stop here because I, if there is any questions about what you're doing or what we are doing you will be uh, very welcome Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, uh, Maximiliano, um, uh, to you as well. And we, yes, we will come back. We're just going to hear from one more speaker, and then we're going to open it up to a moderated discussion and some questions. Uh, but, but to be honest, what you finished with is a perfect segue uh, into our final speaker, Professor Tawane Kupe, um, who, of course, is the Vice Chancellor of the University of uh, Pretoria, um, our, our host today, and you talked, uh, Maximiliano, about higher education and a sharing of ideas, a sharing of systems, a collaboration. You know, perhaps, uh, Professor Coupe, you could, uh, you could start with that, the role of higher education, not just in South Africa, but, a, but across the continent, uh, the sort of collaboration that's really required, the sharing of ideas, et cetera, to move this process forward. Um, Professor Coupe, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. I think the uh, topic you say I should start with is uh, one that is, I'm very passionate about. Uh, it looks like these two weeks, uh, from last week and this week, are uh, my innovation, if you like, research and innovation weeks. So last week, um, I spent most, most of the week in Amsterdam for a network called the University Industry Innovation Network. And it's interesting, some of the ideas we discussed all through Monday to Thursday, uh, have been echoed in the various presentations. And if you look at the SRI Congress, themes, issues, and so on connect with that. So fundamentally, I think what is important, and which I'm passionate about, and we're passionate about it in West of Pretoria, is understanding that one of the weaknesses in the African science innovation system is lack of critical mass and scale. And how you achieve that critical mass and scale of course, it's research capacity development, and I'm excited, as I said in my speech, that there's a lot of early career researchers in this room. Building that capacity is going to be important to the project of sustainability on the continent. But also, when you do not have that capacity, or even if you had that capacity, it is not enough. The interesting thing about knowledge, research, and innovation is that it's global. 
It knows no boundaries, no borders, and is best shared. That is why a transdisciplinary approach is possible. So to me, a transdisciplinary approach is impossible without networks, partnerships, and collaborations, and platforms, and, and, and institutions. I think it's become an institution now, the SRIA Congress, because that is where people meet PHA, if you like, network, build other collaborations. So on the African continent, in pursuit of that agenda and which UP is part of, let me mention a few networks that also ha UP happens to be part of that actually carry out that agenda in a very concrete fashion. First is the African Research Universities Association. It's a network of 17 African universities dedicating to building the capacity that the continent did not build in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Because if you look at the history of higher education, science, innovation, and technology on the continent, if from the 60s up to the 90s or even 2000s, the universities on the continent became largely teaching institutions and not research and innovation institutions. But they also suffered for various reasons, a brain drain to the global north and did not invest in, uh, if you like, early career research capacity development. In the 2000s, associations like African Research Universities uh, have, 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 have picked up the baton stick and tried to restore and build that capacity, if you like, and also doing it via joining a, a multiplicity of platforms. So where UP is, 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 is concerned, so there are 17 African universities there. Let me end by saying that last year, the EU and the AU signed an agreement for greater collaboration between African universities and, and European universities. And a number of projects are unfolding. In fact, sometime next week or the week after, yeah, next week on Thursday, I will be in a panel discussion with President uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron of uh, France because the pro this, this project was an outcome of his presidency of the EU. We'll be talking about how we consolidate and fund such initiatives uh, going forward. So, 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 so th those Afri 17 African universities, in other words, will scale up and have a critical mass through partnerships with EU universities and similar related schemes, if you like. So uh, two more, and then uh, let me then make a few remarks on my prepared, and then we get into discussion. Two examples that uh, UP is involved in, which also in, in, include being part of collaborations, networks, scaling up and producing, doing challenge-led research that addresses local and global challenges. The African Alliance Partnership, which is 10 African universities, including UP and Michigan State University in the US. And what we do there is we have a range of projects joint research projects, staff students exchanges, fellowships, capacity development for research, uh, for early career researchers. And, 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 and we, we're increasing the, the number of universities in that. So imagine if um, a number of those universities in the AAP, uh, I chair the board of AAP, are connected also to the African Research Universities Association. And my strategy personally is to say anybody in a network must look in the network and say, do I have a relationship with others in the network? So create not just bilateral, but multilateral relationships, and that's part of scaling up, if you like. The last one I'm going to mention is the Afri Australia Africa University Network. I'm the co-president co on the African side with Professor John Hinn from Sydney University. And this actually, again, follows a similar formula. Joint research projects, climate change is a big issue in one of the large research projects. Um, um, not, not just climate change, but sustainable food systems are, are one of the, the, the large networks. And also, of course, those two are interrelated. Food sustainability is a key climate change a, 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 a relation, if you like. Again, there, there are 15 African universities and 15 Australian universities. The idea, again, is to scale up and, and make more people join in. When we have our AGM in Canberra in October, I want to suggest that Australia expands into including New Zealand. They are very good at sustainability research, <laughs> and also Australia and New Zealand don't look different to me. <laughs> and, so, and, and so I think we should do. But my agenda really is a scaling up of, of all of these things. Last but not least, in October, we will, in this very room, 
uh, the U.S. Embassy here granted me 250,000 U.S. dollars to bring together a select number of U.S. universities and African universities to meet in this room to actually, in a sense, develop further collaborations along those lines. So, so, so to your question, actually, I think I've, uh, I hope you have answered it. The future lies in collaborations. The future lies in partnerships. The future of gl uh, addressing local and global challenges cannot be institutions working in silos and in their own. And transdisciplinary research is a silo-breaking innovative exercise in itself. And its ultimate uh, outcome is actually, in a sense, what? It's actually so greater societal impact and bringing universities uh, closer to each other. I think, actually, I think I shouldn't, in the interest of having a debate, I shouldn't just go back into my prepared remarks. I think that that topic alone covers some of what I was going to say. In a sentence, what I was really going to say is that if you look at uh, uh, two things, the Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, is very much a, 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 an agenda about the challenge of sustainability for Africa and its ability to loop back into science innovation systems in the manner in which um, uh, Dr. Film Jwara was speaking uh, and the colleague that just spoke now. How do you harness that concretely in localities but across the continent to address those challenges? And those challenges also uh, are best encapsulated in all of the seven, the 16 SDGs. And to your question, and uh, 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 SDGs number 17, partnerships to achieve the goals. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Thank you. Um, all right, we're going to get to the uh, the uh, we're going to open this up to a discussion now. Um, I, we've already had a couple of questions come through online. I will uh, weave those in, and 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 I will uh, get the microphones to you in the room uh, uh, on the, on the ground there in, in due course as well. But let me let me kick it off, if I may, with a with a, cu a couple of questions of my own, and I will um, send this first one over to Dr. Um, Juara. Um, oh, I indeed, anyone can jump in and, and, and answer this. I, I wonder just how far the, 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 the private sector um, can get, how far knowledge and research institutions can get without meaningful policy participation and support. I mean, one of the most familiar refrains, and we all know this, we hear this constantly, is, is the is 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 the, the the need for collaboration, the need for policy collaboration as well. How, how far can we get, Professor Mjuara, with w without that support from the policy side? Uh, not far. It's a simple answer. <laughs> um, so I, I guess the question is policy support broadly, but you also mentioned something about the private sector. So wasn't sure whether you mean engaging the private sector as part of uh, policy engagement, because in South Africa, um, we first try and make sure we are clear uh, with what we want to do as government. And I've mentioned how we've been going about doing that. Uh, but also, uh, what I'm finding in my experience is that it's easy to convince politicians, you'd be surprised then to convince my fellow scientists around the room. Uh, because um, the nature of scientists is that they should be free and be allowed to do anything they like to do. So in our policy mix, we have to allow policy that drive curiosity-driven research and allow researchers to do what they'd like to do. But we then need to have a policy that also is selective on what you can do in a small country like South Africa. And then thirdly, the point you, you've raised, um, to do this you need resources. Therefore you need in what you want to do to bring the private sector in the discussion and in the policy deliberations. And, and we do that perhaps so routinely now uh, that uh, we, we, we don't think about it next week or the week thereafter uh, on the decadal plan that we are negotiating with the scientists, the innovators, the private sector and government, I will be presenting to an organization which is called NETLEC, which is a, a stakeholder body, mainly the private sector and, by the way, civil society and the unions as part of making sure that at least 
what we intend to do as government in the next 10 years is agreed and is understood by all. Um, and also to remind them that all the progress that mankind uh, has achieved is through science and innovation. So, uh, how, how much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may, if I apologies for the interruption, but how, how much momentum? And and we speaking specifically about South Africa now, and then we can broaden this. Um, but how much momentum are you seeing from the private sector in terms of in terms of the support? You know, when it comes to funding projects, which allow the scaling of projects, etc. Specifically private sector momentum, how would you characterize that in South Africa now? I think it's, it's, it's showing progress. I gave an example of the work that we're doing on the, um, on the hydrogen. Mm. Big companies in South Africa like um, Sasol and Eskom have a huge interest in the next generation of energy sources. So when we ask them to participate in the design of this study, this hydrogen society roadmap. Not only were they willing to participate and offer knowledge, they were willing to commit resources. Anglo-American, which is one of the big companies in the hydrogen fuel cells, they have a double interest. One is they mine platinum, so the more you can find the usage of platinum outside the traditional usage, which is mainly at the moment um, in the auto catalyst, which we know with the internal combustion engine going away, they are also looking for other applications and hence hydrogen fuel cells. So I'm just giving you two examples, but we, we think that we're beginning to excite them to be part of the uh, engagements. Um, one of the biggest banks in South Africa, the Discovery Bank, has set up a fund to fund innovations across the entire public system. So I think it's extremely important to, to involve the private sector. Uh, we think that uh, with the right design of the policies, you can attract them. And then also the tricks of the trade is we indicate to them that some of the markets are slowly declining and therefore you have to start uh, investing in innovation and research from your public institutions in order to yes. remain competitive. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judy, let, let me bring you in here as well. Clearly, you've worked in the private sector, you worked in, in the investment banking space uh, uh, as well. Um, the sorts of projects that you've outlined in your presentation, and, and I'd like to come to some of the other projects that you feel uh, um, uh, uh, pro uh, uh, provide the greatest opportunities and challenges across the continent. But in, in terms of private sector participation, private sector support, how are we doing? Uh, we could do better, uh, Axel. Um, as Dr. Joka has indicated, uh, the private sector is coming in and uh, without funding, uh, none of the research will be sustainable. Um, if you look at just uh, the Tutuzela care centers uh, that I spoke about, private sector is funding, but we could have more collaboration with them uh, in terms of the research, transdisciplinary research to make sure that uh, wherever there are gaps, we can close them, uh, but also to expand uh, the TCCs, uh, not only uh, in South Africa, but in the continent, because the challenge is there all over and collaboration and learning uh, from those that have been in the field. But for you to be able to do that, you need the funding that comes from the private sector uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that even the model that you have, you can improve on it, but more importantly, you scale. Who's, Judy, who's doing it well? I mean, to, this is putting you on the spot a little bit now, but across the continent, who, who would you point to as, as doing it particularly well and might be leading the charge? Uh, it would be difficult for me to say uh, I don't have one hmm. country or project that I believe is, is being done well. Hmm. Uh, there are pockets uh, of... Um, you know, excellence, pockets of success, uh, but uh, there is a room for improvement, especially if there is collaboration and sharing of the lessons learned, successes, and where things are failing, where they failed and why. Maximilian, you, you, you talked about um, 
learning is you i mean you specifically on the the, the, the knowledge uh, and higher education piece you about collaboration about learning about working with others well, tell us about the the your experience with the private sector uh, in equatorial guinea uh, okay well in really private sector the most developed private sector here is the oil industry and and we have like uh, not direct uh, collaboration. It had to be uh, first uh, approved by the Ministry of Mine in 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 this insurer industry. But we have been supported by the companies during the past years. But uh, because of the the economic crisis, uh, recently they they choose more to to support like direct uh, health system, not uh, not the research programs, because they they what what they want is like the results, immediate results. Mm -hmm. That was one of our problems because we know that research we can get uh, some results immediately, but more research projects need more than one or two years in order to have a solution to the problem, scientific problem we are we are addressing. So in 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 the country now we are trying to have a more more conversations and uh, and to get the the private sector involved directly with the university, but uh, we you do not have like a I mean, there is a, a huge gap between universities. Now we have two universities in the country. We have a big, there's a huge gap between university and the private sector. Mm -hmm. And that was one of our biggest problems that we're trying to. Yeah. To and, and, I look. Yeah, apologies again for the interruption. I, I'm, you mentioned uh, the reason I interrupt is because we had a question in from one of our online. Uh, viewers who speak specifically to that the the higher education uh, universities uh, and and the gap between academia and industry how and you know I'll come to um, uh, uh, Professor Coupe in just a moment but very quickly Maximiliano how, how do you how how do how do you see us best bridging that gap would you say uh, can can you repeat the question, please? Yes. The, 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 well, it's something you you spoke to. This the the yes. widening gap between academia and what is taught at universities and what actually happens on the ground in industry in the real world. I guess uh, is one one way of putting it. And and how how do you bridge that gap? How do you bring those two sides closer together? So what you're doing, I guess, is the question. The thrust of the question here: what you're yeah. doing in universities uh, is is then very easily be a practically practically applicable when when you when you move into 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 um uh, away from higher education into making these these solutions work yeah what, what's uh one of my my roles at the university is to 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 try to get everyone involved and in, communicate with the a social society politicians sometimes in and not at the very high level because my my own manager is not at the very top level. But uh, we're trying to to sensitize to to make uh, to show the value of the research we are doing at university to the society, and then try to make people understand that it's very important to invest and to being part of the process yeah. because mm -hmm. the university cannot work alone cannot have a, can cannot produce anything if we are doing our own own uh, alone without this connection with the society mm -hmm. so we we are trying to make like uh, seminars conferences in the country in order to make sure that everyone understand the importance of of research and innovation and in the in the society because we we import almost everything yeah. but we know that if we can get many things we can produce in in country in in here and 
and that is a problem because there is not this is not all yet we did not get into this we did not make the 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 huge is huge bridge is not all yet uh, we can we we did we did not have yet the solution but we are trying to to involve everyone um, Professor Kupe, same, same, very briefly, same question to you, the bridging of the gap between academia and, and, and practical on the ground industry uh, uh, um, experience and expertise. What, what's the way forward here? Okay. No, thanks very much for the question. I think they are, they, they are, we have to bridge the gaps also, as uh, Dr. Film Jara said, with government as well. And, and also around how you incentivize academics to do both curiosity and challenge-led research, and then industry. But let me be quickly answer directly your question. I think we happen to be an interesting university, the University of Pretoria, in that we have very strong industry uh, relationships. In fact, in relation to the hydrogen project, I think I have a letter from Sasol and another company asking us to be part of uh, the project that they want to fund. But let me put it this way. Traditionally, the way you do this, and also not just traditionally, the best way of doing this is actually through endowed chairs and research from industry, uh, 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 working with universities. University of Pretoria happens to be the university with the largest number of endowed chairs, where the research often comes, uh, the package in the endowed chair comes in two to three forms. One is support for student bursaries and scholarships, that is for research students. Second is research that is needed by the company for its immediate needs, like what Maximilian was saying. And third, the kind of research that is long term and is required by society, but you have indirect benefits for industry, but by benefiting society, it benefits industry. So almost every year we sign a, a number of chairs in that regard. Last year, I think we signed a chair with Exaro, a large mining, mining company, on XR technologies. They want research from us on mine safety using new a, a, a virtual reality technologies. We want to do research more broadly in the impact of new technologies in society. So the interests are not mutually exclusive at all. If actually well thought through, industry benefits twice. As, as, as it benefits in improving society more generally, what I would call enlightened self-interest, but also benefits more directly in the directed projects that it does, but in fact, it benefits terribly in the human capital that is produced that might end up actually working in their own domains. So I think this, this uh, the way I see we, we're doing it at the Investor Pretoria and uh, what I heard in Amsterdam last, last year is the way forward to bridging those, those particular gaps. Then the university has to do something that is additional to that, that assures industry. Industry, of course, is concerned about whether graduates who come out of universities have the skills, capabilities, and attributes to work in there. Now, what is important there is to create what I call a co-creation of graduate skills by industry and, and the universities. And we work very, very well in that. Last year, actually, we got the South African Graduate Employers Association for the university that best prepares students for work. It's called SAGIA. And this is how we do it. We have three programs at the university. We have a ready for work program where we use industry mentors and, and also industry people sit on boards for professional degrees and also advise on the curriculum. We keep our autonomy, of course, in that regard. We also have a free online entrepreneurship course for those students who want to go out and create employment. And recently, we launched a center for the future of work, which is going to research and enrich our curriculum research new hybrid working practices and jobs of the future. I wrote an op-ed piece three, four weeks ago. Many of the top companies you have mentioned, Anglo-American and others, ESCOM and others, actually want to work with the center and we are working with one of the large mines to actually, in essence, design a program for reskilling works of the future given the disruptions of the, the digital technologies. So it's not impossible to bridge the gap. And in fact, at the investor of Pretoria, I would say we are bridging the gap. We are discussing okay. right now proposals around you know, innovation, technology, and sustainability, where industry will work together with, with, uh, with, um, uh, with the university. 
Okay, thank you, thank you very much indeed, Professor Kube. Um, uh, Judy, let me let me let me bring you back in here, um, and we're going to step back again a little bit. You talked, I mean, you 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 outlined um, in your presentation um, a particular uh, area uh, in which you're uh, that, that you're looking at. You also at the end talked about the uh, the, um, the economic empowerment of women, and I'd like to come onto that a little bit as well. But but stepping back first, what what do you think are alongside the the, the ones you've laid out some of the main sustainability challenges um, in Africa right now? Would you say uh, poverty is high up there? Mm. Uh, inequality. Uh, especially when it comes to gender, um, uh, climate change, obviously. Uh, so we have quite a few challenges. And coming to South Africa, when you look at inequality and looking at the Gini coefficient, that is uh, not 0.68 or closer to not 0.7 now. For me, with inequality, there is no sustainability of any economic growth. Mm. So for me, that is the biggest. How, well, I mean, this is something, a question we, we pose to, to, to many people, so given the, the pandemic, um, given the, 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 the economic crisis, the, the global inflationary outlook, given the energy impact uh, from, um, from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, how, has this have these uh, um, pieces, if you like, set set us back, or do you think um, there are good examples of of, of governments uh, grabbing these as opportunities to to move forward in a positive way? Right, uh, you you raise uh, very important points because when you just look at the COVID pandemic, it has set us back. Uh, though it has taught us different ways uh, of doing things, like Professor Cooper was talking about future of work. Uh, when you go to the rural uh, schools, uh, you actually now are forced to look at blended learning. Uh, but it goes back again to inequality because every pandemic that we encounter actually hits the people that are uh, in the bottom of the food chain more than anybody else. Uh, when it comes to unemployment that came out uh, because of um, the, the pandemic uh, COVID, 55% uh, affected women. So I think all these challenges, uh, food security, uh, the energy challenge that uh, we do have and uh, actually will get worse before it gets better, mm. uh, it all talks to leadership. Yes. It yes. all talks to leadership because uh, you look at the unemployment of the youth, which in this country is sitting at 55% of the youth, all the issues, all the goals that we have, we mm. can only achieve them with leadership and accountability but, and but the, leadership across sector. Yeah, and this and this comes back to... to uh, uh, Again, we come back to leadership. Again, we come back to um, to, to the, the support we need. Where are you seeing this? And, and again, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Where are you seeing the support, the sort of leadership that's required um, to overcome these issues? Are we seeing that anywhere right now? Uh, you know, you see them in areas um, in our country. If you start there, uh, we do have challenges. Uh, we all know that. But uh, one of the ways of ensuring that we overcome the challenges that we have is rooting out corruption. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're seeing that happening, but it's slow. Uh, people have different views on Rwanda, but uh, having been there several times, uh, I see that the leadership there uh, is moving the country in the right direction. Okay. Uh, if you look at the initiatives, uh, if you look at the commitment even in terms of rooting out corruption and ensuring that uh, the country is uh, the economic growth in the country. Um, if I was to look at other countries in the continent, um, I can't come with an immediate example except uh, the ones I've mentioned. No, no, I mean, well, thank you for raising Rwanda. Um, Phil, um, uh, Jawara, let me, let me say, same question to you. Who sh where are you seeing real leadership? 
right now? Where, wh 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 who can the rest of the world, look, the rest of the continent, but the rest of the world look to in Africa uh, as providing the sort of leadership required to, to, to see us through these challenges? I think maybe like Judy, there are pockets of areas that gives you a sense that uh, things are moving in the right direction. I'm not going to repeat uh, Rwanda. We uh, are part of the SADC uh, structure uh, where we now, I think there was a, a, a group of uh, ministers in SADC um, that met last week. So that helps because that's where lessons learned uh, from other countries are shared. And mm. within the SADC, I, I think that uh, our neighbors, uh, Namibia and Botswana, are not bad examples of countries that uh, um, have leaders that demonstrate, as uh, Judy says, corruption is not, um, is, is, is not acceptable. And that are investing in, in youth uh, as part of the next generation of the growth of the country. Uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. when, your, yeah, your first sorry. question, the challenges of COVID and, and, and what we've learned and other challenges in the continent. In my personal view, I, I think the youth dividend that we have in Africa should not be seen as a problem. With the open science, with big data, the digitalization, I think it's easy for the youth to be excited in those areas. Um, and therefore, I think the leadership that will harness youth in these new areas as well, and Kenya is not a bad example from that perspective. So that's why I say to, to to simplify the answer would be dangerous. It's, it's, mm. it's, uh, it's synonymous with what I had with a friend that says, when you talk things in average, it's like saying my head is in fire, my feet are in ice, and on average I'm okay. So I, I hope that <laughs> gives you a sense of uh, us being very selective uh, and, and really look for those um, nuggets of things that are showing that in the we are moving in the right direction yes no i no i, I absolutely and I, I i agree with you wholeheartedly but on just very quickly on the back of that when you look out when you look out from africa to the rest of the world who do you who, where, where do you see the sort of leadership if at all that inspires you i, th I think rwanda this is still no, no, but, but I, I talk, I'm talking about the rest of the world, out of the continent of Africa. <laughs> uh, I, I think there's a general, not so much confidence in the political system, I think, globally at this point mm. in time. Um, because again, even the complexities of what's happening in the Ukraine, yes, uh, invading any country is, is, is not acceptable. But um, uh, recently I went to, um, to the UK and I was uh, pleasantly surprised to hear that they are really worried about the rising cost of uh, fuel yeah. in, the, in, in the UK, the rising yeah. uh, quality is food. Um, now, we've just heard last week about the World Trade uh, Organization looking at uh, uh, how do you make sure that there's food sustainability uh, as a result of uh, the war and how do you start to look at... Uh, so, I, I, I can't think outright of a country where I would okay. say... I think everybody's probably trying to figure out um, you know, the, the, the geopolitics, and, and I, I, I can't think of any, really. Well, um, maybe, perhaps, it was, perhaps it was a little bit unfair of me, the question. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's, let's leave that there. You dealt with it very diplomatically, I must say. Um, <laughs> look, I, I want to I wanna throw, throw uh, we've, had a, we've got a few more questions from, from our online audience, and I will get to those, but I know Professor Burton is uh, on standby in the room with you there to assist with any questions from the audience. So I, Professor Burton, I just wondered if there's anyone who has their hand up there who wants to uh, to grab the microphone and ask anyone on the panel a question thank you thank you axel yes there are a few so let me just kind of coordinate those for you we have three roving microphones 
um, and uh, I'll ask the people who have them to, uh, to come down. And so if you could just indicate, please, as an audience, wh who has questions, if you just put up your hands and then I can direct the microphone can carriers. The there you go. Uh, just, if you would just say who you are before you start. Uh, I'm Osma Alam from the Science for Africa Foundation from Kenya. So my question is to you, Dr. Jawari. I mean, first, thank you for your very honest words and inspirational words at the same time. So, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, financing and the importance of it. So my question is two points, right? So one, apart from advocacy, and you've already used that word, how do we push for more national funding from our governments, for you know, us as Africans, for our communities, our research, our agenda? So how do we you know, push for that? And then secondly, as African scientists, as African you know, policy makers, Af African entrepreneurs, how or what are the pathways that we can take to ensure our data influences the policy pathway? So thank you. Thank you. Do you want to take another one? Yeah, while we, anybody else? Uh, yeah. Why, why, why do we have one more yeah. question and then and then we'll we'll, uh, we'll put it to our panelists? Go ahead. There's one right up. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Abla Yusuf. I'm from the University of Pretoria, uh, from the Department of Zoology and Entomology. So, uh, listening to the panelists, what I was wondering is that I think we are forgetting something on the continent when we talk of sustainability and research and innovation which is indigenous knowledge. Uh, I want to get a take of the panelists on how do we uh, uh, enhance the, the vast indigenous knowledge that we have on the continent when we look at sustainability. Because if you look at, the, at first, when we had the handing over of the, the message, there, there was a, a thought about uh, indigenous people from, uh, from, from other places. So I think uh, we should, think this carefully and not forget our own indigenous knowledge when we talk of sustainable uh, research, innovation, and development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Phil, would you like to start with some answers to that? Yes, thanks. Uh, l let me start with the question from Kenya. Uh, the two questions are how do you convince governments to put money into the science and the research system? The first is, uh, as scientists, and, and I, I, I'm trained as a scientist, um, one of the things we have to accept is that doing science because it's fun is, is not really cutting it for society and for the politicians. And I know it's one of the hardest things for scientists to be reminded of. So it is important to identify not all research that is being done benefits society, but it is important for the scientists to say, how can we convince governments that what we're doing is relevant to society? Uh, and there are different globally uh, institutional arrangements and policies that are being driven. In South Africa at the moment, we are driving, driving something with the National Research Foundation, which is called a science engagement but also science to policy. Because we think that, uh, and, and it's so hard to do this with the scientists because we're saying, we need to cut your money to have this program so that even you as scientists will start working together. I gave an example of the global change work. It's, it's, it's easy what I'm saying, but what has happened behind the scenes to put a group of scientists to work together has not been easy. I'm not going to talk about inter-institutional collaboration. Professor Cooper will never allow me here at the university, but it's, it's, it's such a complex set of how scientists need to think about themselves and how they convey uh, the message of the value of science, research, and innovation slightly differently than to say we're doing science uh, and, and, and it's important. So I think you have to identify those advocacy processes. When you do that and the value of science is seen by the politicians with examples, then it becomes easier for us as policymakers to then ask for increased funding. Mm -hmm. We were lucky in South Africa, again coming back to your point, 
with the COVID because the investments that we made in 2001 were the investments that allowed the, the, the South African scientists to identify Omicron. The rest of the world was angry with us for identifying this. But nevertheless, people saw the value of science to society and how science can inform policy because those scientists were brought in in all the structures on how to decide how to deal with this. So uh, I hope I've answered both that uh, the scientists must play a role. Uh, we policymakers can, can assist working with you to take that message then to the politicians. And then you need to think about structures of how do you translate science and, and, and help to inform policy. But I mean, offline, we can give you examples. And then just the short uh, response to the indigenous knowledge systems. We've set up a whole policy arrangement starting with an act and how we work with communities in order to identify scientifically the active ingredients from these uh, natural products and indigenous knowledge. So it, it's a policy but an institutional setup of how you can really make sure that it's the, the knowledge is raised to the same level as other knowledge systems. I'm going to ask Professor Coupe to have a word now. He has to leave for an urgent meeting in a few minutes. So I guess we hand over to you, Professor, to just uh, make your kind of concluding remarks. And then if there are other questions, we can I'll pursue them afterwards. Ed, also in Please my concluding ahead. remarks to your, to, to give answers to your questions and to say, Phil, I'm a little more optimistic about you, Peps. We are overdue for a dinner and you are behind the cave in some of the things that we're doing. So inter-institutional collaboration is actually, we haven't put volume to it. It's happening at a grand level. You might be aware of one. Recently, I think it's your department that called for proposals or the NRF for an institute for Pandemics. pandemic preparedness. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we were one of the universities that, was, uh, that was, has been pre-selected, if you like, to put a proposal. But let me correct myself, we're not the only one. We have a consortium of five universities across the traditional historical divides. And that's just one example. So the dinner invitation is coming. <laughs> so, 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 and you are right that the intra-institutional collaboration will persuade the politicians. Second, also again behind the cave for dinner, in this room two weeks ago, the minister and the presidency on behalf of the presidents launched our presidential research services initiative for the 26 universities. Remember when the president met with Chancellor Scholes three weeks ago, he mentioned that the 26 universities are now providing research for the presidency's research. We have done, I think, successfully completed 10 projects now, 26 in the pipeline. So it's happening. <laughs> and, so, and so I think that that will, is part of what you say. If politicians see that universities are necessary for their immediate needs, for research that is impactful and can change society. The next step might be them thinking about. On the university side though, we also need to translate our research into language understandable to policy makers who live on a five year electoral cycle and like, <laughs> and like a professor <laughs> who is tenure up to, <laughs> up to retirement. And then uh, the last question I was going to say on the IKS, my last statement is that I think that if transdisciplinary knowledge creation is not about aggregating existing knowledge, but co-creating knowledge, it is very vital that indigenous knowledge is part of that co-creation, if you know what I'm here, if, if you see what I mean. Because you want the knowledge that is the most impactful, most contextually relevant, and adds value to society. Okay. An emergency Senate meeting, there's no problem at all, but <laughs> <laughs> we all have to vote on a key appointment, so I have to <laughs> get out of the room. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Coupe, if you would like to use one of our facilities here yeah, to do your meeting, um, I, I just ask if there are any other questions and then hand back to Axel, but thank you very much indeed for your contribution, we really appreciate it. Thank, thank, thank you for you. having me. And thank, thank you. Everyone enjoy. Can I just ask if there are any other questions from the audience? There's one there, if you'd like to go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jesse DiMaria Kinney with the Adaptation Research Alliance. And first, I'd just like to thank the speakers for, for a really interesting conversation this morning and in starting off uh, SRI. 
Um, my question has to do with the idea of collaboration is key. And me personally, and also the Adaptation Research Alliance, fully agree and endorse that idea. But my question is actually about how do we move away from competition? Because academia and the private sector are highly competitive spaces. So in order to move closer to uh, this collaboration that we need, how can we actually move away from competition? What is needed for that, or what do we need to do? Would you like Judy to have a go at that first, and then we'll ask you? Would yes. You like to she <laughs> Judy might like to comment on that one. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting, um, especially when it comes to business. Uh, it's actually um, wanting to win, uh, sometimes at the expense of others. But I think the co-creation, that's where the co-creation comes in, because in the co-creation, you make sure that everyone has an incentive. Everyone has something uh, to win or lose if uh, the collaboration doesn't work. So I've actually seen in this country, if I can just add in quickly, uh, how we are having an increase in collaboration between the private sector, the universities and government. And uh, Dr. Mdwaha will be one of the midwives of this uh, with the SAA, SASME fund, uh, where there is a fund that is uh, supporting the innovation from university, uh, commercializing them, uh, turning them into something that is useful society. So I, I really believe, and one of the panelists actually spoke to this, that there has to be something in it for each of the partners in the collaboration, because human beings are competitive. If there's nothing in it for me, why should I even bother uh, doing anything? And uh, seeing the time, uh, Excel, I think um, I, I would like to just close by saying, I'm looking at one of the questions talking about inequality. Uh, having touched on the SASME fund and the collaboration uh, within the different um, disciplines, I do believe that what will uh, remove uh, inequality is um, creating an ecosystem uh, that helps young entrepreneurs to flourish, small businesses. And uh, I do think um, Kenya is uh, doing it better than we are. Uh, there are so many elements uh, to the creation of that ecosystem, uh, which I don't think we've got right yet. So uh, for me, uh, that is where we will get the dividend. Uh, without doing that, uh, it's going to be quite difficult. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Um, and, and look, th thanks for those closing remarks. And, and one final question to you, and it's, it's a question, a similar question I'm going to put to the other panelists, which will hopefully draw out uh, some, some closing thoughts. Uh, you know, the, the, the context here, and, and we talked about this recently in Stockholm at a, a UNEP event, um, when we look at the, the UN Human Development Report, the Human Security Report, uh, what's going on with the, the IPCC numbers and whether we can reach them, uh, the SDGs, et cetera, et cetera. It looks pretty bleak, the context. I've, I've got to say, how do you maintain your sense of optimism? Because I guess you have to maintain a sense of optimism. Um, how do you do that right now? Uh, for me, Excel is uh, uh, it's, it's understanding that I have the power to make a difference, no matter how small. Mm. If I just give you an example of one of the, of the things that I'm involved with, uh, academic uh, developing an, a, a pipeline of uh, academic uh, women uh, to do research for leadership, uh, it might seem like it's a tiny thing, but collaborating with philanthropists with the, the universities, um, you, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, I have no doubt in my mind that everyone in the room and everyone online is doing something. So, but the biggest thing I would like to say again is leadership, leadership, leadership. Yeah. Judy, thank you very much indeed. Uh, appreciate those thoughts. Um, Maximiliano, let me, let me uh, throw it to you for some closing thoughts from you. I imagine the, the leadership piece will be there as well. What keeps you optimistic now? Are you optimistic? Oh, well, uh, uh, before I said that, I want to talk about uh, the indigenous, indigenous knowledge. One of the questions they made from the 
the side. I mean that the, the indigenous, indigenous knowledge is, is important, but what we have to do is the connection between this knowledge and in the research system. Because for example, in Equatorial Guinea, we are losing and we are we are the, the society is moving some way in this. We are losing a lot of knowledge that is very important in order to improve or develop the country and the continent as well. So it's important to make the connection between scientists and in these people that they, they know many things about our, our continent and our, our life. And then so, um, and for closing, I mean that we need to, to collaborate, but collaboration as Dr. Lamini said, mean that everyone has something to, to win. I, I, I will not go to the side of losing because when you know you're going to lose something, maybe you're not, you're not being tested in in work with the other side, so it's 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 good to compete. Competition is is important also, because without any competition, we'll not do anything. We'll not have the the motivation to innovate or to to work together. We need to. But what is a very 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 necessary is to make sure that everyone understand the importance of uh, the inclusive work as a, as a whole, not as a particular issue. Research, sustainability research and innovation is a, a everyone benefits, everyone. So mm -hmm. that is very, that is the way we have to work that and maybe anyone understand that we, we win if we work together. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. And that's a nice way way to end that. Thank you. We win if we work together. Um, and Phil, let's get some some brief closing thoughts from you as well. With with that in mind and what we've just heard, um, are you? Is your glass staying half full? Would you say? <laughs> I just want to close by perhaps commenting on the question that was asked at the end about. Collaboration. I think there, there is now realization that the uh, world is interconnected set of countries, activities. And, and what happens in one part of the world will affect you whether you know it or not. I learned recently that uh, the wind storms from the deserts um, in Middle East carry nutrients that feed the Amazon in South America. And, and we have seen this. Uh, we see how uh, global change, for instance, would have fires in, in, in Cape Town, Australia, because of something that was not really done by people in Australia or in Cape Town. So I hope that's a good enough incentive for us to design programs from the policy perspective that at a global level encourage collaboration and I, I think um, Future Earth, uh, Group on Earth Observation need to be funded at the level that will then continue to look for this collaboration. Future Africa is looking at how in the continent uh, together with some of the initiatives that we're funding uh, or our Tambo chairs, uh, the attempt to set up an African Research Foundation to stimulate research across the continent. So I hope that's, that's, that's one way. The other one is to learn from other disciplines, maybe not transdisciplinary that they've done very well. I always say that uh, astronomers are great collaborators across different parts of the world. And I think we should learn from them uh, on how uh, they, they, they've done this. Maybe sitting alone, looking at the stars all night makes you to want to talk to other people. But, but let's look at that, and, and then as I say, as policymakers, as government, let's think about how do we have glue money. And then lastly, just to say that I, I hope that uh, you continue putting all the different uh, institutions that are thinking about sustainability through this conference. So uh, the, the ones that are around here and others, please bring them in, because uh, the ad system is a complicated system and we need each other. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. And look, uh, I've got a wary eye on the time, so uh, I will uh, make my closing comments extremely brief. It, 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 it's always a real thrill for me to, uh, to get involved in these sorts of discussions. As you can imagine, um, most of what I do is very focused on uh, the policymakers. Um, so it is extremely refreshing for me to get uh, the perspective of, of the scientists and the, uh, the knowledge uh, institutions. It's clearly such a critical, critical uh, piece of, of, um, of this whole pie. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone, uh, all of our speakers, Phil, Judy, um, uh, Professor uh, Tawana Cooper, and uh, Maximiliano uh, Ferromene uh, for your contributions today. I think we've set the stage well for um, a, a, a rich uh, forum and a rich discussion uh, going forward. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let me hand it back to uh, Professor Burton. And I'm, I'm just very, very sorry I couldn't be there in person uh, with you today, but it's a beautiful day here in London. Uh, hopefully it's as beautiful where you are. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It is indeed a beautiful day here today. And thank you so much for taking this, the lead in this conversation. And this does draw this session to an end, ladies and gentlemen. There is a short break now, and then we launch into the complexities of a hybrid meeting where there are about 1,500 people involved uh, one way and another. So I hope you are all going to enjoy all of that interaction. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Phil, for your participation here.